From Advisory Board, we are bringing you a radio advisory, your weekly download on how to untangle healthcare's most pressing challenges. My name is Rachel Woods. You can call me Ray. Healthcare is commemorating National Nurses Week by celebrating and acknowledging nurses' contributions, something, frankly, we need to be doing all the time. Nurses are essential to the entire healthcare ecosystem, so it's no surprise that recent data show that the workforce shortage, particularly among nurses, is the number one issue for executives. Leaders recognize that a workforce shortage isn't just a problem for RNs or for the HR department. It's a system-wide problem that will impact nearly every part of an organization, including quality and safety. That's why in today's episode, I brought two leaders from university hospitals. Peter Pronovost is the Chief Quality and Clinical Transformation Officer. Michelle Hereford serves as Chief Nursing Executive. Together, they're going to discuss the complexity of grappling with nursing shortages and why we need to reimagine the work that nurses do. But before we talk to them, I want to bring in Advisory Board's own Chief Nursing Officer, Carol Boston to get the scope of what's happening in the industry. She's going to share some new data for 2023 and explain why the work being done at university hospitals caught her attention. Hey, Carol, welcome back to Radio Advisory. Great to be with you, Ray. So we know that the last few years have been challenging, to say the least, for the nursing workforce. It's something that you and I have talked about on this podcast quite a bit. My question to you today is, are any of those pressures getting better? What are you hearing from the industry? Well, you know, to answer that question, we need to look at the latest data, both the NSI survey of providers reporting updated turnover and shortage statistics that was just released as well as advisory board survey of nurse leaders reporting top RN workforce concerns requiring investments in 2023. Taken together, these two surveys provide some good news as well as some bad news. Good news is this. Overall, RN turnover has decreased a lot, like almost 5%, which is great. Oh, wow. Yeah, and it demonstrates that some of our early retention strategies, like upping compensation, greater scheduling flexibility, even internal travel agencies are working. Okay, but what's the bad news? Well, other data is problematic. Despite some good news, we can't get too complacent here. For example, Despite overall RN turnover decreasing, novice or first-year turnover is up again. Hmm. With baby boomer retirements looming, we need to dig even deeper into turning this trajectory around. Novice nurses are our future. Hmm. Also, time to fill vacant RN positions in acute care is up substantially. And nurse burnout remains unresolved, with reports now directly linking quality and safety being impacted. And what scares me about the bad news that you just shared is that this is all happening at the same time as organizations tell us that they want to increase the size of their workforce. That's right. That's exactly what the NSI data reflects. Even though the nurse leader's number one workforce concern, as reflected in our survey, is a complete lack of qualified nurse candidates available to hire in many markets across the country. So you can see the disconnect here. Hmm. Also, providers are reporting their intent to use the same high level of travelers in 2023 as they did last year, which isn't financially sustainable, as everybody is aware. So even though there's some good news that you shared at the top of this conversation, because there are just no nurses left to recruit, leaders are stuck bleeding the same amount of money that they, they have been over the last couple of years. Brutal statement, Ray, but I would agree with you completely. You mentioned that overall turnover is down because of the good work that organizations have done. They have responded to the things we've been telling them to do over the last couple of years, like increasing compensation, like more flexibility, and so on and so forth. But the data tells me that we have to do more to stabilize the workforce. So Carol, what are we missing? 
Well, novice nurses are our future, Ray. We've got to lean in to the unique needs of this unique employee population, even more so than we have done in the past. The data provides us a sobering reminder of that. But really important here, redesigning the work of the registered nurse in acute care is becoming mission critical, which includes top of license support, getting rid of work that gets in the way of efficiency, quality, and safety, and really leveraging technology to automate what could be automated, all of which can provide the opportunity for nurses to focus on the work that really matters and what's most meaningful to them. Hmm. I would say that beyond model pilots, we have got to scale this work at a pace far greater than what we've been doing over the past year. Yes. And I know that this is hard to do, but in my travels, I do work with a lot of system executives that are rolling up their sleeves and addressing this mandate head on, including my colleagues at University Hospitals Cleveland, which I'm thrilled to have joining us today. Yeah. Let's turn it over to Peter and Michelle to tell their story. Hi, Michelle. Hi, Peter. Thanks for coming on Radio Advisory. Hello, Ray. Hi, Ray. So I know both of your titles, technically, right, what they are on paper, but I wonder, can you share with me and our audience a little bit more about what you do at university hospitals in your specific positions, but also how you work together? So as you know, Ray, I'm the system chief nurse executive, and I'm responsible for the oversight, I'll call it a vertical, which includes nursing, nursing caregivers, advanced practice providers, respiratory therapy, environmental services, and food and nutrition professionals. Peter and I have had great opportunity to work together. And and definitely during these challenging times, it was necessary Mm -hmm. for the two of us to come together and align on, on the work ahead. We think alike but we think differently. Hmm. Yeah, a nursing executive and a... Peter, what's a quality and transformation officer? Maybe it's better called a chief instigating officer. <laughs> so the, the quality piece is, you know, relatively straightforward. It's, you know, responsible for safety experience, sure. clinical integration. The transformation is, you essentially think of it as a couple roles. One is running our ACO and our employee health plan to make sure that it's maximized value. And then importantly, helping evolve the organization to maximize value. So this evolution for all the care we do to make sure it's the highest value possible. Mm -hmm. And obviously in that role, nurses play such an important role in the care delivery that Michelle and I are joined at the hip for so many things. And one of the ways that you are joined at the hip is helping to solve the workforce crisis. I would like to believe that you can solve that for the world, for us. Can you add that to your to-do list? Uh, We're working on it. But at least starting to address it at your at your home system, at university hospitals. I want to have a moment of vulnerability, actually, with the two of you. There's a lot of talk about what the crisis means, what shortages mean. And there's a lot of fear around nursing shortages, workforce shortages, starting to impact actual patient safety. Is that something that we should merely be afraid of, or is that something that is already happening? Ray, from my perspective, it's already happening, and the national data is bearing that out. There's been several studies showing that the rates of complications have gone up pretty dramatically. I mean, like pressure injuries are up like nearly 70%, Mm. and there's a variety of reasons for that, but without a doubt, staffing both staff shortages. So we have high ratios and inexperienced staff contribute to that as well as having agency staff who don't know your culture or your protocols. Yes. You know, where I, it is real. It it is real. There was a time that many organizations would not admit that. Yes. But this is real. And I'm sure it keeps many leaders, many caregivers and others up at night. I'm proud and happy to say, you know, working with Peter is great, but UHN, UH overall, has placed a tremendous focus on our workforce. And it's not just the things that you probably read about in the paper. It's the needs of our workforce. The workforce has changed. People have changed. And we must change with them. 
we absolutely must change with them. And one of the changes that I am so happy that we're starting to see is executives like you coming together and saying, you know what, this is not just a nursing problem. This is not just a problem for that cost center over there. This is a problem for our entire enterprise. This is certainly a problem for quality and safety. This is something that we need to get the best of our leaders working on together. So I want you to go into a little bit more depth about the two of you. You've got this shared problem. You've said that you can be joined at the hip together. What does partnership look like for your two teams and for you two personally to start to solve this workforce crisis? One, it begins with us trusting each other immensely and mm-hmm. focusing on the work rather than our responsibility. So I will meet with, I mean, I'll give you an example with Michelle's managers all the time. I mean, like, like we're, we're one team and Michelle meets with the clinical transformation and our care managers as she re- redesigns care models all the time. And it's, we're all aligned around giving the best care possible. Those are, I think, some pretty concrete examples of how this deep trust between us removes any kind of territorial or hierarchy about what are you doing in my space? I love that. No silos. That's the key, actually. Being able to trust each other, identify that there is a common goal common concern. And the way we work together it is definitely a reflection on mutual respect that must exist in, in any relationship. But it sets an example for the rest of the organization hmm. and for those that work directly with us. One of the things I would also share with you that I, I think, and I know actually, makes this team, and, and specifically Peter and I, a great team, other than being kindred spirits, we, we talk about that all the time. But we, we both always want to know why. Why has this occurred? Hmm. What is your answer to that? And when you say this, I'm assuming you mean why are nurses suffering? And or if there was an event, what are the details? Ah, like an actual safety event. Correct. And as you continue to, to peel that onion, and, and, and it's a continuous peeling, you get to the source of the true why. Hmm. Not always what we see, that is. And, and Peter and I have the same philosophy around that. And I think this is how the two of you have come to at, at least a starting place in starting to work to reduce the staffing shortage, both in terms of number of people, in terms of people that are embedded in the culture, and Peter, as you said, in terms of the right expertise at the right place. And I think where you landed is a place that a lot of nurses would be happy about, which is the unbelievable administrative burden that is on, frankly, all clinicians, but is particularly true at the bedside, right? We know that a ton of below license work just gets shoveled to bedside nurses. And I'm assuming that as you're peeling back the layers of the onion, getting to that why, that's an area of focus for both of your departments where the nurses are suffering and also we're starting to actually see some real safety issues. Is that how you came to that initial first step? Yeah, Ray, you're so spot on and it's insightful. You know what? And Michelle's done brilliant work of retention and paying bonuses and all that great blocking and tackling that needed to, to be done. But Michelle and I were both aligned with, as you said, a lot of the nursing work that they do doesn't need it to be due. And so we said, how could we systematically address that? And so I had facilitated a discussion with about 55 of our nurse managers and several frontline staff and asked them a series of questions about which policies do we have does the burden exceed the benefit? Hmm. And then once they listed those, how much time do you spend doing that per patient and how many times per patient day does it need to be done? And then we added, is it a CMS policy? Is it a joint commission or DMV? Or is it our own policy? And what was stunning, there's a couple stunning things that came out of that, was they summed it up to be 60% of a nurse's time, six, zero. I mean, it was un- unbelievable. Oh my goodness. And the vast majority of them were our own internal policies. I mean, that we, over the years, accumulated a whole lot of policies. There were some that were CMS and the team was excited. We arranged calls with CMS leadership that they presented some of the things that they wanted changed, like the nursing care plan. 
and CMS was highly responsive and it was quite energizing for them. Most of them were around frequency of documentation. Mm. We've changed about 70 policies, but those 70 policies were embedded in nearly 2,000 order sets. Oh my God. So we're now going through each of the order sets to take out that wasted time. But I can tell you the nurses are just energized about this work. I mean, they really are excited about the potential yeah. to free up that amount of time for them. Well, even back to the, the idea of the partnership, I, I imagine there's a world where you're sitting down with these 50 nurses. You said they were nurse managers? Correct. And even the signal value alone of saying, I'm here too, right? I'm the chief clinical transformation quality officer. And we believe that this is actually going to be a quality safety problem. And we're also here to help you. Even just that signal value of you coming together, I think is a is an important piece of this story. After we did this, there was like literally there was like giddy energy in the room when they were buzzing and saying, oh, we can imagine if we do this. And one of the managers said, you know, Peter, this is really strange. We have a policy review meeting every month where we ask about policies that need to be changed and we haven't had any agenda items. And now oh, no. we just identified 60% of our time. And I, so I questioned them. I said, so let's unpack that. Why do you think that is? And I think they, they said, you know, once when you work like in an environment, you just get used to it the way it is. You get this in safety, we call it normalization of deviance. Like it's just, and the second is we weren't, confident that we would get things changed, that we would, you know, have people who'd be willing to use this. Tapping into that, I think it's probably a universal feeling across nurses because for too long, their voices haven't been heard. Yes. And so signaling that, hey, you come up with ideas, your voice will be heard. As Michelle and I say, this leadership style that we are implementing is, you know, completely moving away from command and control towards unleashing and inspiring people to say, you come up with ideas. Our job is to knock the barriers down to put those ideas into place. Yeah. So let's talk about that. So you've identified all of this non-value added work, up to 60% of a nurse's time. Where do you go from there to start saying, we've not just heard the problem, because I guarantee you, even long before this, Michelle was hearing that problem from a lot of frontline nurses. (laughs) Every nurse can attest to that who's listening to this episode. Where do you go from, all right, we've identified all this non-value added work. What's the next step to actually getting that off of the nurse's plate? It sounds like your first step is actually an interesting one, which is not let's delegate that to someone else, but let's just not do it. Yes. Yeah, so the steps we went through is first, we revised our policies. And so like Michelle said, why? We assumed when the policy was put into place, it was wise and was defending against some risk. So we partnered one of these nurse leaders who wanted to revise it with the person who created the policy in the first place and said, and with our educators and said, okay, are you, are you okay with changing this? Does it, does this change make sense? And every one of them, they're like, yeah, totally makes sense. We're in a different time. We don't need, you know, don't need to do this. And, but then once we changed it, the hard work Ray was all of those policies were embedded in order sets. So, right, right, she, yeah. you know, you will do vital signs Q2. Okay. We don't really need to do that or you'll document this. And so we have to go find every one of those order sets that needs to be changed to take it out. And that's the work that we're doing right now. So before we get to the order sets, I want to ask, was there really no pushback to eliminating these things? There's a few to say, okay, does this really make sense? But always looked at in the risk benefit ratio of, okay, this is where we are right now. And this is the time we're spent documenting. Some Ray and we've pushed Joint Commission and DMV, where when CMS or DMV or Joint Commission are ambiguous about what's required, our legal and compliance people tend to err on the side of conservativeness, right? And so some of this was in the face of ambiguity, we were really, really cautious. And now we're saying, okay, well, we probably were too cautious. We don't need to err on that much anymore. But I think people would be surprised to hear that from a quality and safety officer. I wonder if you can give me an example of one of these things. Michelle, I'm not sure if you have an example of something that was set out by UH or CMS or what have you that you decided this isn't actually valuable for us to do. The risk benefit is just not there. We're going to eliminate this. The thing that comes top of mind is is documentation. And, And we all had the experience during covid and the recognition that the the type of documentation, the amount of documentation 
may not be truly what's needed in order to deliver care at its highest quality state. And so we spent some time reevaluating whether or not we needed to reinstitute, I'll call it the burden of some of that, that extra documentation. Yeah. And we have found ourselves in, in a crisis mode. We removed it. We reinstituted it. And then we found ourselves again in a situation where we, we removed the requirements, the demand, I should say, that was placed on us. Clearly, we know and we believe and we will work with, with others to remove unnecessary documentation. It's really important. Yeah. I did want to elaborate on on one other item just to, to make a point around sort of how did we get here? So yeah. talking about policies, I'd like for us to keep in mind that often what happens is we create pathways to accomplishing whatever we need to accomplish. And then something changes, whether it's a new requirement, whether it's a new standard, whether it's something probably as simple as the structure of a unit, the reporting relationships. Yep. Or a bad event happens. Or a bad event happens. But something happens. And sometimes we, we get very connected to the work that we've created in the past. And we, we do not sunset things well. <laughs> No, we do not. not. And so before you know it, you have a policy on top of a policy embedded in a policy, embedded in a policy or an order set, and letting go of that and having a process of how to go back and reevaluate when change needs to occur is really what's important. Before you even get to the order sets piece, how long did this take? This does not sound like an easy task. No, it wasn't. So the 60% amazingly was literally one hour brainstorming that half was out on policy and the other half was on what technologies could we use to take work away. Yeah. Then we went through prioritizing which ones waste the most time Mm -hmm. and then which ones are also the most feasible to change. Because some, as you said, we we selected ones that weren't going to be controversial. So you may have seen those grids where you plot things on impact and effort. Yes. Classic advisory board move. Yes. Yes. So we we focused on that biggest time wasters and that there was going to be little controversy. Most of those were, as Michelle said, around either frequency or elements of documentation. Okay, sure, we can get around that. And then once we prioritize those, that's when we started pulling together, you know, Michelle's educator who produced a lot of the policy, our a nurse who runs policy, the nurse who runs our magnet program, and then whoever produced that order or the policy in the first place. Sometimes it was one of those people, other times it was different, to then make sure people were comfortable about changing it and then took it through the, to a policy group to, to get it revised. So that was probably... Michelle, what do you think? Maybe three months to get that done. So still relatively short, Mm. but a pretty intense and structured piece of work where we followed it through. And now you're in the midst of the next phase, which is actually changing it in the order sets. That's exactly right. Tell us about how this process works, the work that's gone into it. And I'm assuming you've had to partner with some other folks for this part of the process. One of our nurse leaders is an IT leader. So she helped kind of now lead that next phase to say, okay, how are we going to do this? And we got with our IT leadership to put a process of screening these order sets. Our current EMR doesn't make it easy, Ray, because it's really hard to screen for an individual order. You could We could search order sets, but not necessarily individual orders. There's, I know there's some technology out there that allows you to do that. And so we're literally going through that process of going through, as I mentioned, it's a little under 2,000 order sets to make sure that we take these policies that are wasteful of staff time out. We'll be right back with more radio advisory after this short break.
Join Advisory Board for a webinar on May 31st to learn about the state of digital health and the role technology will play in addressing the workforce crisis. We'll also take a look at Nuance's DAC solution and hear from leaders at Nuance and University of Michigan Health West about how DAX relieves documentation burden and supports clinician and patient experiences. Learn more by clicking on the events tab at advisory.com. We've been talking thus far about eliminating non-value-added work. The other side of the coin is delegating, right? And saying who or what else could do this work. Peter, you just mentioned in that initial brainstorm, there was excitement around the role of technology. What kinds of work can technology do to take work off of the nurse's plate, especially at the bedside? Yeah, right. I, this, I think, is one of the under-invested and under-focused areas. In addition to the po- – like, I think every hospital should do this policy exercise we did. I mean, where else could you get 60% of a nursing time or think about expand your nursing workforce by 60% yeah. and you're the culprit? Yeah. But the, the technologies, I think there's a couple. One is nurses hunting for supplies. They spend 24% of their time pretty much at every hospital, and there's technologies to solve that. Another is documentation. You know, we put so much focus on physician documentation and getting, yeah. you know, scribes or technology, but nurses and even like nurses aides or PCNAs spend a ton of time documenting and that, you know, should just be a huge focus for technology. Some of it, like any vital signs or labs should be automatically documented. I mean, that's just a waste. There's technology that can do that. But then even the clinical documentation could be automated. Another one, Ray, that we've experimented with is nurses double checking medicines. I mean, it's it's not very accurate and it takes a ton of time. And there's prototypes out there that you could just have the a computer confirm that, you know, the, the dose of heparin change is right or the narcotic dose is accurate, that it doesn't need to be manual. So I think there's a ton of work that with some focus could be taken, could be automated. Michelle, how did the nurses react to this particular idea, to having technology come in and take on some of these tasks? Incorporating what we, we actually title and incorporating supported technology. Hmm, I like that. It, it's, it's really to support the care team. That's right. You don't know, we, we all talk a lot about, you know, language. And it's important that I would say the world understands that this isn't all removing the, the work from the nurse. It's supporting that entire care team so that there are items that no longer are actually to be carried out, perhaps, by the nurse. But at the same time, there are other things that are created that may be carried out by by other nurses. So I'll give you a perfect example. We piloted a virtual admission nurse and a virtual discharge nurse. Hmm. That's work that still needs to occur. However... Rather than it being a direct one-on-one interaction with the assigned nurse of the day, we elected to see as if we could virtually work with nurses from a remote environment who could spend that 30 to 45 minutes doing an admission overview and assessment, providing discharge instructions, all of which supports the care team, supports the assigned nurse. And I think that's an important aspect of this. And they're doing this from home? They can do it from home. Mm. They may be assigned to a centralized location. Mm. It's a perfect opportunity, perhaps, for a nurse who is in a different time in her career. Yeah. Um, Someone who may be retired, maybe a a working mom or stay-at-home mom. Yeah. So great opportunities. And, and that's what we do. We create opportunities, open the door and walk. Through. I wonder if you've gotten this pushback, though, because when I often talk about particularly technology that is making work more efficient, taking work off folks' plates so that they can be more efficient, the pushback that I tend to hear from caregivers and providers themselves is, oh, that's because you just want more work out of me. 
yeah, you're going to take all this stuff off my plate, but it's because you want me to hit the gas and see more patients and do more and, and, and get more out of me. Is that a concern that you've heard or how have you addressed that? Believe it or not, Ray, you, you will think that maybe UH is just a di- different beast or animal. It's not resonating in that fashion. Admittedly, I tend to hear this more from physicians than any other member of the care team. Yeah, and, and Ray, what, what I think the, not as Michelle said, we're not getting the pushback. What I think is legitimate is in the past, there's been tons of technologies that promise to take work away from the nurse and they've all added to the burden. Ah, yes. I've been down this road before and it was not helpful. Glucose checks or whatever. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, oh, some administrator says, I'm going to get your productivity up. And they weren't tested with the nurses. It has horrible usability and it almost always adds to the work. So I think the difference in this approach was the nurses prioritize these work areas. They said, this is a problem. And mm. as we look for technologies, they will be the ones leading it. I mean, it's not going to be handing out a glucometer and saying, oh, look, I've just solved all your problems, right? And, yeah. and the nurse scratch their head say, no, this is terrible. My favorite part about this story is that you did not default to bringing in more people. I still think that's how most of our leaders are, are thinking. We just need to delegate off of the nurse's plate who is the next human being <laughs> that we can bring in to do this, which we know is extraordinarily difficult in the workforce crisis that we're facing because whether it's a medical assistant or a CNA or whoever it is, we're seeing those people leave healthcare entirely because they can make more money, have an easier job and get a manager track at Starbucks or Chipotle or Panera or whatever it might be. And I love that in your examples, we have not actually talked about in this conversation, delegating to other people. We've talked about eliminating tasks and using technology. That's correct. Not so much delegating, but sharing tasks. Yes, thinking about the whole care team in a holistic way, as opposed to just pushing things kind of downhill, downhill, which is, whoever is at the end of that road is going to suffer. And for a long time, that that person was the nurse, but it's going to be someone, which is why I like this approach so much. I wonder if you can speak kind of directly to our listeners for a moment. They're thinking about this idea. Maybe they're inspired by your story. What lessons have you learned from your partnership? that you want to tell others to convince them to come together like you have and address the workforce crisis as a shared problem, not merely a nursing problem. This is both a humbling and hopeful story. Hmm. The humbling part is what we live every day, right? With burnout and unsafe things. The hopeful part is think about how much better we're going to be if you can take even if you take half of that 60% out, I mean, that's like breathtaking, right? If you can free up that amount of time yeah. to do work and, and, and the nurses sense joy in this. And, mm. you know, and my sense is if we do the technology pieces that we, that we mentioned, it's easily 50% of staff's time that could be freed up to better care for people or get more balanced workloads. And, and so I, what I would say is go start talking to your nurses or get an executive team to say, what are your own policies that are burdensome and the burden exceeds the benefits? What technologies might you do to t- really, truly take away work and then make sure that you actually implement them? Peter and I, again, share the same philosophy around, around many things. Healthcare is, is a team sport. Care delivery is a team sport. It's not one discipline's problem in isolation. And having the recognition of that is really important. But hearing it is one thing. Yes. How we go out and demonstrate it is something else. So Peter and Michelle walk together, talk together, round together. That's important. Mm. And I think the other thing that's important for us to to take some time to also talk about, because I know we've, we've talked about technology and 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 I'll call it alleviating some of the burdens, but I don't think we should should leave the conversation without understanding technology and removing items from from the list, if you will, do not substitute for the, the true healing power that we have as individuals. Hmm. You know, it's a genuine caring, yeah, respectful discussion. 
And, and we can't underestimate that. Technology is supportive and it's helpful, but technology will not address that true healing power that we all have. You know, Michelle, just building upon that, you'll see how we're kindred spirits. A lot of our transformation work, what we say the purpose of it is, and it's a beautiful concept, is to leverage the power of love within and between people hmm. to radically transform health and health care. Hmm. Once you tap that powerful force, I mean, it, it is the most powerful force in the world. Well, on that note, before we close this episode, what other things do you want to see our listeners do to support and frankly, to celebrate nurses? There's a tremendous amount of work ahead of us. I mean, this is what Peter and I are talking about is it's just a, a little chip off this, this overall iceberg. Oh, yeah. And one of the things that we recognize as an organization is first, it was important to listen to the people who are closest to patient care. And, and Peter elaborated on that. And then we decided that as we listened to people, we needed to bring the people together so that you form that team. And the team problem solves together. We created an opportunity for those teams to be creative and think about what needs to happen moving forward. And so it's almost like you have a, a whiteboard, a blank sheet of paper, and, and the dream comes to reality. And then think about all the other things, all the other challenges that you can apply that framework to. I love that. You know, there's some proof points that what we're doing is really working. I mean, the you know University of Hospitals last year won the American Hospital Association Quest for Quality Award, not for any one measure, but for our leadership approach to getting to, to, to zero harm. And despite these ratios and harm going up in the country, and no doubt we have our flaws, but our harms, almost all led by nurses, have gone down dramatically. And, you know, we've, in the spite of these crises, you know, implemented a mobility program that led by nurses going through the roof, a med safety program, zero, zero harm. And the way we approach these is this model of transformation. You know, I mentioned the purpose about drawing the power of love is what we call believe, belong, build. Hmm. Look at the beliefs that we can get to zero harm. And then tr the belief of our leaders as Michelle said, is to honor the wisdom of the frontline people. In other words, your job is to unleash and inspire, not to command and control. Belong is building structures where we can have the free flow of ideas. So we're mm. a 23 hospital system. For all of these harm things, nurses are leading system-wide efforts that some of our critical access hospitals are giving tips to our main academic hospital. And there's just this profound respect and you know, and Michelle's job and my job is to create the culture that honors those wisdom, but then just let the team share ideas. Yes. And then building our management systems, when we find those practices that work, we deploy them at scale. And so it's just, it's a pretty magical formula once you tap into it. Well, I'm certainly inspired by this and I know others will be as well. So thank you for coming on Radio Advisory and thank you for all that you do for nurses and for the healthcare profession. Thank you. Thanks for having us, Ray. This conversation underscores just how important it is for leaders to work together to make progress on some of our most common and complex challenges. But I want to make sure you're not just focusing on supporting nurses this week or this month. If we're going to get ahead of this problem, we've got to start addressing the root cause issues that are impacting the workforce. That means we need to reduce the administrative burden of medicine. And frankly, we need to make the work better. And remember, as always, we're here to help. As you celebrate the nurses in your life during National Nurses Month, check out our Clinical Workforce playlist to learn more about how you can support them year-round. You can find that link in our show notes. If you like Radio Advisory, please share it with your networks. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and leave a rating and a review. Radio Advisory is a production of Advisory Board. This episode was produced by me, Ray Woods, as well as Katie Anderson, Kristen Myers, 
and Atticus Raj. The episode was edited by Dan Tyag, with technical support by Chris Phelps and Joe Schramm. Additional support was provided by Carol Boston, Carson Sisk, and Leanne Elston. Thanks for listening. And remember, as always, we're here to help. My chair just squeaked. (laughs) Dan, you made this face of like, what was that? (laughs)